Our study on the book of Romans, this is Sonship Establishment, and this is going to be session number 65. Now, as we talk about Sonship Establishment, I don't want you to lose track of where we are in the midst of all this. I'm going to be saying some things tonight that it's important for you to keep this in the context in which we have framed it coming up to this point. When we talk about Sonship Establishment, I'm just going to abbreviate it here, you know that that is actually running from Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 16 and running to the end of the chapter in verse 39. I'm not counting Romans 9, 10, and 11 right now, but really and truly, that is part of your sonship establishment as it talks about the dispensational change. Yes, if you had come through in a biblical theology, you would have come through the book of Acts. You would have seen the dispensational change take place. You would have seen the Gentiles getting the gospel, not through Israel, but apart from Israel. You would have seen Paul come to the forefront. You would have seen the fall and the diminishing of Israel. You would have noticed all those things. But you wouldn't have gotten any doctrine that was meant for you. Because when you're going into the book of Acts, you're looking at a lot of things that Paul is doing as he is also carrying a message to the Jew first of their fall and subsequent diminishing. And so, when you get into Romans 9, 10, and 11, now you're getting doctrine about that dispensational change that is intended for a member of the body of Christ. So that is going to continue your establishment. But for the sake of the book of, 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 of Romans now, this, this uh, for, I'm sorry, for chapter 8 of the book of Romans, that's going to run from 16 to 39, and that is divided into those three parts. We've covered the first one, and that's chapter 8, verse 16 to 25, in which you were told some things about how you're, what you're going to do when you get up there uh, to labor with your Heavenly Father. You were told about the creature and its earnest expectation. You were told about the bondage of corruption. You know that it's counting on you. You understand that's a living creature, and we talked a lot about that. No, you don't have all the details of it, but at least you have what you needed to, for you to get that patient endurance waiting for the day in which you're going to be able to get up there and do the things that your Father desires for you to do. The second part was in chapter 8, verses 26 to 27, and that one is the one we're in now. It's the one on prayer. It's not just two verses thrown into the midst of something completely out of context. One of the things I'm hoping to do tonight is to show you how these two verses appearing where they do in Romans 8 are not only continue that whole line that he's taking you down, but that it makes perfect sense for them to be sitting right there. The last one is going to be chapter 8, verses 28 to 39. And um, that, that one is going to really sum up that last particular part of your sonship establishment. There's a lot of things that we're going to be looking at when we get into these verses because this is a, a, a critical, critical part of your sonship establishment. So let's read these two verses that we're looking at right now on the PowerPoint, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. By the way, let me just stop the reading just for a moment. Those groanings that cannot be uttered mean you can't utter them. Obviously, the Spirit can, yes? So, and by the way, there's a reason you can't utter it. Does anybody know why? Because you don't know what to say. That's exactly right. Okay, verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There was a couple of key things that we've been looking at here. One of them, of course, was... No, 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 not the review yet. Uh, one of those is that we have some infirmities. Paul doesn't explain what those infirmities are, so you're supposed to know something about them by the time you get over here. We did a lot of that work last time, and of course, I hope that you read through the notes on that. But there was another area that's contained in these two verses, and that is the searching of the heart. And even though I introduced you to that and I talked to you about that a little bit, tonight we're going to really pull the curtain back on that and begin to answer the questions I know 
that you have about that. Because, you're, you, you know, anybody can look at that and think, okay, well, how does that work? And how do I know what God's telling me? And, you know, and all that kind of business. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort all of that out for you so that you're clear about it. But I have more things to say about it. So I'm just pointing that out for now. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look very quickly at a short list of things that you should already have a good general knowledge of. I'm not saying you know every detail of it, but generally you should know what these are about. I'm going to go through this because if you have a problem with any of that, I need to know about it now before we move on and leave that behind. And you've got this thing in your mind that's bugging you this whole time. I need to put all that to rest. So now with this short review, the first one is we are in a real father-son, father-daughter relationship. I tried to drive that home last week. The second one on the list is God wants this relationship to be real and genuine so badly that He has set aside dealing with you out of His omniscience and His omnipotence. Because if God's just going to know you from heaven, that requires no relationship whatsoever. He'll just know, and that'll be it. But that's not the way He is determined for this to go. The third thing that you should know is that sonship prayer is a non-optional part for every believer because our sonship education depends upon that prayer. And that's the whole driving force behind, I'm calling it sonship prayer, but actually, folks, this, what you're going to, I'm, I'm not going to confuse you, but you're going to come to the place where you understand every prayer you pray is a sonship prayer. Every one of them is really going to fall under that category. The only reason I'm really kind of pointing it out now is because right now, you have some ideas about prayer in general, but they really don't have anything to do with the education itself. That's not your fault. It's just because you're not over there yet. Okay, here's the next one. The Father wants to search our hearts, and He wants to do that so He can assess by what He hears what our understanding is, and He can confirm that our thinking is right or that it's not right, and then we can get some assurance that we're getting the full benefit of the education. Those are important things. Now, that's why he wants to do it. That ought to be the reason you want him to do it, so that those very things can take place. Uh, next of all, we have a general knowledge of our infirmities. We should have gotten that from the lessons last, uh, last time. But because we are going to be inexperienced in the education itself, because of that, we're going to come to a place where we won't always know what to ask for. And that's going to present a problem if our education is going to continue. We also know, or should know now, that this is a temporary condition. This is a temporary condition, okay? Okay. <laughs> That's a temporary condition, but eventually our progress through the education is going to make it so that you won't stay in that place, and your father doesn't intend for you to stay in that place. Think of it about, think of a, a, of it about in the context of earthly adoption after the fashion of this. Here's a father that adopts his son. He's training him in the business. Well, in the beginning, the son may ask him some questions and say, you know what, I really don't know what's going on with this. But after the son's been at it for 20 years, when he's still saying the same thing about the same questions, you have to be asking yourself, did I make the right choice, right? Because you don't need him to keep acting like he's a child with no experience and no understanding. So do yourself a favor and settle this issue right now. The intercessory ministry of the Holy Spirit is something He is doing temporarily until you really get to the place in the education that you yourself know what to ask for. God is not glorified by you spending an entire lifetime going, what I do now, what I do now, what I do now, what I do now. That's called incompetence. 
That's the whole reason you're being educated. So dismiss that idea, because that really doesn't work. And then our Father also has taken into account that we have these infirmities, and because our education is determined by us having this two-way conversation with our Heavenly Father, if we don't know what to ask for, instead of letting that education come to a stop, then the Holy Spirit's going to make intercession for us at those times we do not know what to ask for, and the Father's going to answer that prayer as though you yourself were asking it. That way, He can do what you need done, even when you didn't know what it was, so that your education can continue right along. And to me, that is an amazing prospect. And what this is meant to do, as I told you back when we started this whole establishment thing, as I told you there were two... Although there's, there's three attitudes that are being put in you in the midst of all of this, there's two overriding goals that this is supposed to achieve, and that is an absolute confidence that what your Father tells you can be trusted implicitly, and that the, what this book will produce in you is, is going to work. And that there's, you're not going to encounter a situation where God's going to go, well, you know, that worked for everybody else, but I... I didn't know Ron was going to run into that. That's never going to happen. You're not, and this is one of those things that should make you look and say, man, God really has figured this out. And that's one of the reasons it's amazing to me. Because, and it really does produce that confidence in the curriculum. There's only one thing the curriculum cannot fix, and that's if you quit. If you decide to quit... God is not going to throw you down on the ground, put your arm behind your back until you cry uncle and decide to get involved again. You're an adult son. If you don't want to be involved in your father's labor, then don't. Although you are going to the heavenly places, you are going to get a glorified body, and you are going to be involved up there. My thought is, you might as well make the best of that. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, it's going to be one or two, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so does anybody look at the list that we've gone over here and say, I really don't know what that's about? Okay, I'm not asking if you, if you look at that and you go, I'm in total agreement. That's not my job to do that. My job is for you to make sure, to make sure that you understand the principles by which all this is, is happening. You know, you can reject every bit of this, but I will tell you, if you do, coming here is a complete waste of time for you. You know, really, you'd be better off at the bowling alley. But I'm, I'm not, I mean, really, you know, I'm just saying, you know, we're, let's, you know, but I think you're here. I'm not really, hmm, I'm not, I don't have anybody in mind here, but every once in a while we get an email. Okay. So anyway, my only point is to say that if you're ready and this is all, you, you, you think, okay, i got a kind of a working knowledge of this. We're going to move on. Is that good? good. All right, and that's what we're after. Okay. Um, there are details about sonship prayer that I know that we haven't covered yet. And the, so that's what I want to begin. And by the way, you won't get them all tonight, but don't worry. We are going to get to all of them in the, in the time that we're supposed to. And this is at the point in where I say to you, as we got ready to go through this education, remember I gave you a chart that kind of kept going up, and what you had here was two parts to level one, and that was your sonship orientation and your sonship establishment. That constituted the two parts to level one. And when you got to level two, then you had those four decision-making skills of wisdom, Judgment, I'm sorry, justice, thank you, judgment, and equity. And, boy, I made a mess of that, didn't I? <sighs> yeah, okay. Now, what we're talking about utilizing the searching of the heart for, folks, is not going to take place until you're over here. 
That's what it's made for. Now, I know what, as soon as I explain it to you and how it works, I know what you're going to be tempted to do. You're going to be tempted to go home and say, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the Lord to search my heart about this or about that. But I'm going to tell you now, this is not, the, Romans 8, 26 and 27 is not about prayer in general. In other words, I've, I, I've, got a, I've got a job offer, and I'm already working a job, and I don't know, does God want me to keep the job I got, or does He want me to go take the other job? And you're saying, I'm going to ask Him to search my heart. That's not what that's intended to do. This is intended for you to get the full benefit of your education. So it's sitting over here. I'm saying that to you now. But I, even though I'm saying it to you now, I'm going to have to come back and show you some specific things because in your mind you'll default back to that other. Don't get to thinking that this does more than it's, in, in, it's created to do. Okay, now, and again, we, we will get a chance to talk about that. Now, you're getting in Romans 8, 26 and 27, really a very general look at this whole issue of prayer but that's all you're going to need in order for this thing to do the work that it's supposed to do. In a sense, the reason God brings it up here, so I'm not getting it out of order. God's the one that brought it up. But He's bringing something up to you that is still, listen to this carefully, because this is going to come into play in a, in a little bit in the lesson. He is bringing something up that is still yet future for you. But there's a reason he's bringing it up before you get there. And we'll talk about that reason. But what I want to make sure that you see is th this gets brought up, but it's not about what you're doing right now. In fact, I'll, I'll say it like this now and repeat it again later. Right now, where you are in your sonship education, what you mostly pray about is about being a son or daughter. That's mostly what your prayer is now. Father, I'm real excited. I'm so glad that you've given this education. I'm glad that I'm getting to be a part of it. I want to get up in the creature and, you know, and all. But, you know, it, but it's, it's about the things you know about being a son. When this really comes into play, your prayer is going to turn from praying to God about being a son Two, it's going to be about living as a son. And that's a critical difference. And so, one of, it's, it's almost a difference about hearing about God and then knowing Him. That's a big difference. Well, this is about, and that, by the way, I don't mean, when I say that, I'm not being critical of any of us. That's all you can know. Uh, until you get over here, you can't begin to do this. Now you, you say, well, sure I can. I can say, God, I'm, I really want to live the way I want to. He's not going to magically make that happen. You understand, this happens as a result of you putting the education to work in your life. There's no magic to it. So you can ask him to, it would be almost like failing to study for the test and say, God, I need some answers. The voice from heaven is going to say, good luck with that. <laughs> because you're not going to get those answers. Okay, now, what we're doing now then is we're, if you've ever played any kind of a sport, if you ever had a time when you sat in the locker room and the coach drew up plays on the board and he said, okay, here's how this play works. That's one thing to sit there and to see it and to see how it works. But it's another thing when you walk out on the field or on the court or whatever, and now you run the play. Now it takes on a whole different dimension. And as you practice that play and practice that play and practice that play, then it comes time that you're going to put it to work in the game where the real rubber meets the road. And that play either works or it doesn't. But you know what? After you've run that play and run that play and run that play, after a while, you're no longer thinking about that play the way you did when you first saw it drawn up on the chalkboard sitting in the locker room. 
Now you think about it in a much more practical aspect. That's another way of saying, in one sense, you were talking about it potentially, but when you get out on the field, now you're talking about doing it. And that's, a diff that's the difference that we're talking about here. That's the way the searching of the heart is going to work. So right now, all I'm really doing is drawing up the play on the whiteboard. So when I talk about the searching of the heart, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because I don't want you to get frustrated. Because if you don't understand this, you'll like I have already heard from folks, I almost got so frustrated I, I didn't know what to do because I was trying to make this work. And then when I was going back over the notes, I saw that you said, that's not what you're going to be doing right now. If you try to do that now, you will be frustrated. And I don't, that's, I'm, I'm telling you now, don't worry about it. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I have decisions to make about things, and I need to know what decisions I need to make. You know what? Here's what God expects you to do. Just make the best decision you know how to make with where you are. He said, well, I need these skills. Well, you'll get them when you get them. But until then, he's not expecting anything more out of you. Do you really look at your first grader and go, I've got all this calculus thing three times with you. When are you going to get it? You don't ever expect more out of them than they're capable of. God's not doing, you understand? Okay, even though I'm saying this, somebody, I'm speaking in English, I'm using little words, somebody's going to come back and go, you know, I tried that this week, and I tell you what, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is, we're going to take a look at this from a couple of different sides. We're going to look at the curriculum from what we expect the searching of the heart to do for us. And here's the second part that very few people think about, and that is what the searching of the heart does for our Heavenly Father. It does do something for Him. And, and, and that's something that we need to be aware of. So um, the searching of the heart. And it, look, what's next? Is that up there? Yeah. The searching of the heart involves two things. So let me just give them to you here. It involves our communicating with our Father. Prayer is just talking to Him, right? It involves our communicating with our Father how we perceive the instruction in wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, and how that can be applied to more areas than just the ones in which we were taught it. That makes sense? You're going to be taught something and you're going to be taught in a particular context. And you're going to see that, and you'll go like, I understand how that works. But then you're going to say, I think I can take this same principle and apply it to an entirely different area. That's exactly how that's supposed to work. That's what turns it from just being a form of doctrine to a principle that you now live by, that you can actually use in more than just one way. And they're made to use in more than one way. But God's not going to teach it to you in every single circumstance you could ever encounter it. Do you know why? You couldn't carry your Bible if He did that. It would be like a set of encyclopedias. It's easier to just teach you the principle and then teach you how to employ that principle. And then you guess what? No matter what the situation is, you're going to be able to look at that and go, you know what? I know what to do with that. If you've been looking in your Bible and say, how am I going to deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption? I know I'm going to do it. How am I going to do it? If you're looking for a one, two, three, like a set of instructions, like walk up on the right side of the creature reach behind him, that, that's, it's not in there. But when these principles, and, there's, and that's why I told you in the beginning, there's only four of these decision-making skills. There's not going to be four more next in level three or four. There's not going to be more of them. It's just going to be a refining of these. <coughs> We're at the beginning. You use these individually. And then all of a sudden, you've come to a more complex way of using them in which you'll combine two of them together to make a decision. 
Later, you may, con you may combine all four of them together. The complexity of it increases, but it's just the same four skills. Now, listen to me carefully. There is not a decision you will ever have to make in your life or in eternity that cannot, that conclusion cannot be arrived at by you without the, by these four skills. That's all you're, you're going to need. Now, that looks simple, but there's a whole lot in there. Just as I told you, he's going to teach you wisdom, but he's going to teach it to you in six parts. And those others have multiple parts. So the first thing the searching of the heart involves is, I'm going to be talking with my Heavenly Father about this third component of godly wisdom, about applying it to an entirely different area than the area I was taught it in. Does that make sense? To everybody? And, and so that only makes sense. Here's the second part. The searching of the heart involves our Father communicating back to us as whether we have properly applied those sonship skills. That would be one of the good paths He considers to be good, see? And confirm or deny that we're headed the right way. Now, do you remember in the last lesson where we talked about paths? plural, and a way, singular. Remember we talked about that? And, uh, now, and, and, and we're going to be doing a little more in that just because that's going to lend itself real easily to what we're talking about. But don't lose sight of this. The first thing the searching of the heart involves is I'm going to be talking to my father about using this thing I learned in ways that I wasn't taught it, and I'm going to have to hear an answer coming back from him as to whether or not I'm thinking about this the right way. But you remember what's sitting in there is the use of these four decision-making skills. It's not about anything else. This pertains to the education itself. Everybody with me? Okay. So you're not going to be able to use the searching of the heart to do some of these other things. Now, God wants to search our heart so he can make sure that we are headed in the right way. And how does he do that? By what he hears coming from us. Every father does that. He sits down with his son, and you know, normally the first thing that happens is, is he says, how'd your day go? And the son talks about his day. And the father's listening, and as he's listening, he's really hearing how his son is perceiving things and understanding things and responding to things, right? Right? Your heavenly Father's doing the same thing. All right. Now, there's, there's, there's a few things I haven't told you about now that I'm, I'm going to have to tell you about. But I know you have some questions. We are going to get to these. But I know you're wondering, how do I actually go about getting my heart searched? I know that you said God's not going to do that until I invite him to do that. And that's true. But you might be wondering, what should I expect when he searches my heart? You said that God is actually going to confirm or deny to me that I'm thinking about things in the right way. How is he going to do that? Look, let me dispel this for you. An audible voice is not coming from heaven. There is not going to be a cloud bank roll in and a voice is going to come from heaven saying, that looks good to me. And then you move on. That's not how that works. And if you're thinking, oh, well, there's a verse in the Bible I'm going to turn to. Well, here's what I would ask you to question. First of all, if you turn to the same verse every time, wouldn't you just get the same answer every time? Here's the other thing. If you said, well, it depends on which verse you turn to. And there's the second question. How would you know which verse you were supposed to turn to? See, I mean, if you're asking the question in the first place, so, how is God going to do that? There's a pendulum swing the other way. You know what that is? I'm going to dream up what God is saying. Or I'm going to look for a sign. Hello, Israel. I'm going to look for... God, if I'm heading in the right way, I just need you to give me a sign. And then your phone rings. Thank you, Lord. That's all I needed. I got news for you. They were calling you anyway. 
Really? When so, you said, God had them call me. Have you ever picked up the phone and go, hello? And they go, I don't know why I'm calling you. God just told me to call you, and I'm just, I have no idea. I'm just calling you. I've never had that happen. By the way, someone that's thought about that question may say that to you. God did not tell them to do that. Either, well, you either got to take Paul's word for it or their word. I've already made my decision about that. So that's not what's going on with that. So what is God going to do with that? And how will I know when he's through searching my heart? You said I'm going to know when to say amen, and you will. Now, would you love to know the answers to those questions? Okay, we'll do that later. <laughs> we are going to do that today. We are going to do that today. I know you don't believe that, but we are. But because we're adult sons, we've got to be able to discern every good path. And that's what this education is geared to enable us to do. Because at the outset, now this is important, at the outset, God is, I don't want to say more concerned. He's focused on this. I want you to be able to discern what I consider to be one of the good paths and what I consider to be an evil path. And when I say an evil path, I'm not talking about, oh, we're worshiping devils and we're doing that kind of, that, if it's not in this group, it's automatically in this group. You understand? No matter how benign it looks. Are you, are you? Following what I'm saying? So, so that's what he's, he's, in the beginning, he's not after you, what you're after. You're after, well, I know there's some good choices I can make, but I want to make the best one. Well, of course you do, but you're not ready to do that yet. The thing you're ready to do is to be able to be educated in how to know how many good paths are out there. He said, well, if he tells me, how, if I know there's this many, say there's five good paths out there, how am I going to know which one? You're an adult son. Pick one. And that's going to be hard for you to come to grips with. Because all of our life, indirectly and directly, we've been taught God has the single bullseye. And if we don't get that, then we somehow missed it. You understand Romans 12, 1 and 2. Here it comes. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. By the way, those mercies... By the time you get to Romans 12, 1, you should know what those are and be able to tell somebody what they are. We read this verse, and we don't really think what's contained in it. Those are referring to something specific. It is by those mercies that he is beseeching them. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Almost everybody sees this this way. This is the way it gets preached. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to, to offer yourself as a living sacrifice. That's not what he said. He said, your body. What is unique about your body? It's the only part that didn't get redeemed. And he's saying that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You tell me. You already know the answer to this. How are you going to have your mind renewed? Oh, okay. But, uh, and what's the process of it? Yeah, the sonship education is what's going to renew your mind. That, that by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Guess what? He's not going to tell you what his will is. He's going to educate you to know his will. And you're going to prove it. No pressure. <laughs> it's up to you. You're going to do that. Now, that's an, amazing, that's an amazing prospect. And, and, and in view of that, is it any wonder, sometimes in the, in the beginning, you'll say, I'm not really sure what to ask for. And then the Spirit makes intercession for you. So guess what? The Lord will give you exactly what you ought to ask for, and you'll move right along. Isn't that great? It's gear, geared for your success. Okay. Now, we talked about why God wants to search our heart, and that ought to be the reason that we want him to search our heart. 
But the best thing we can do now to discover some answers about the searching of the heart is to go back to a major place because Paul doesn't explain about it here. By the way, in all of Paul's prayers, did you ever notice that? And we went through them all. We went through every prayer he prayed, every request he made of others, and everybody else's prayer that he referenced. We went through them all. And did you notice that he didn't give you one example of him asking God to search his heart? Do you know why? It wasn't because Paul didn't do it. Matter of fact, he's the one that wrote this thing we're looking at in Romans 8, 26 and 27, right? He that searcheth the hearts. So it's not like he doesn't know it exists or he, he's unfamiliar with it. He is very familiar with it. But why doesn't he give you an example of, let me show you what I prayed when I asked God to search my heart. Because it's going to be different, and he's not going to give you something that you'll just repeat for the sake of repeating. How dangerous has it been for our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. People pray that like it's a magic rabbit's foot. All right, so that's the first thing. There's another reason he didn't give you one. Now, that's the big one, but there is another one. Yeah, because one's already been given for you. You've already seen an example of this. Psalm 139. And we're going to go to Psalm 139. So here we go. Psalm 139, uh, you know, oh, thank you. To the chief musician, a Psalm of David. And by the way, those superscriptions, those are very important. Um, sometime we'll talk more about those. But you know that this is one from David. And so this is insightful. So here's verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Then might tell me, how does God know about all of that with David? David tells him. That's right. I'm so glad to hear you say that. And that's a risk because anytime you say that, if someone would say, because God's omnipotent and he knows, oh, this makes me want to go get one of those big cinnamon rolls and overdose on it. Because in the next verse, verse 4, he's going to say, I've been telling you about this. And he's talking with his father about everything. But you, as we, and we discussed this verse last time. This is really David going over his day with his father. He's talking about everything from the time I get up to the time I lay down at night and everything that goes in in between. Now, this psalm doesn't record all of those things. He's just saying you know about all of this because I've told you about it. And, and you'll do those kinds of things too. Remember, I know sometime back, whenever you were saying to me, I, I don't even know what to pray for anymore. I said, one of the things that would be good for you to start practicing is to just go over your day with your Heavenly Father. Don't worry about knowing what that's going to produce in you right now. It's just, it's just formulating a, a good way to get used to that. Now, the reason you're going to go over your day later is because you're going to be putting these sonship skills into practice and guess what? As you're doing that, you're going to be talking to your father about that all during the day. And that's going to be happening. Now, David um, makes a statement here. He says, thou art acquainted with all my ways. That word acquainted, if God was using his omniscience, that would have been the wrong word to stick in there. What does it mean when you become acquainted with someone or something? Wait, I got, I got, I'm sorry, I didn't get them. Somebody, Dorothy, what did you say? Okay, that, that's a true thing, but, uh, but I, I need something, I need more specific. If you, let's suppose you became acquainted with Pam. What is that? You just, okay, you, you're now becoming familiar with something that, previously you didn't know right see because you don't get acquainted with you, you, you didn't to, you didn't get acquainted with Nadine today you already knew Nadine we all know Nadine okay all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you see that's something you didn't know so when he says you're acquainted with all my ways he's saying you you were made to know something that you didn't previously know do you see how this is working? You've heard me talk about that book of synonyms that George Crabb wrote back in the early 1800s when people used the English language 
in the way that the King James tra translators used the English language. Before we got off into, you know, all the things that we're off into here, I thought it was interesting. So I look up the word acquaint in Crab synonyms to see what he says about that. Because this is a real education for me, you know, getting the language right. It's not the problem that the Bible has selected a, a, a bad word. It selected the perfect word. The problem is we don't appreciate the words for what they really have in them. The first words that George Crabb writes is this. One acquaints a father with all the circumstances that respects his son's conduct. It's, is it not incredible to you that the first sentence that George Crabb writes to talk about the word acquaint is in the framework of a father-son relationship. I thought, wow, look at that. And so what's he doing here? The son is, one acquaints a father with all the... He's telling his father about what's going on. You know what that is? That's sonship prayer. I mean, I thought, man, that is great, isn't it? And here's David talking about, you know all this because we've been talking, I've been acquainting you with all of this. I hope that you see that for what I see in that. Now, let me take you back to verse 1, and here's what it says. Thou hast searched me and known me. And now what I need to say to you is, in Psalm 139, there are actually two kinds of searchings going on. The first one is in verse 1, right here. He says, Thou hast searched me and known me. Now that's a past tense deal, but did you see anywhere in the verse where David said, you know, I, there's something I don't know what to ask for, and so I'm asking you, you know, I, I don't know what to ask for. Do you see any of that there? But that's what's in Romans 8, 26 and 27, isn't it? So what I'm going to tell you now is that the searching that's going on in Romans 8, 26 and 27 is not the searching that's described in verse 1. Because there is any question being asked about this. He's just saying... I've told you all about my day, basically, in the verses that follow. I've told you all about my day, and you already know all about that, right? Let me ask you, is David having a problem telling God what happened that day? No, a normal son doesn't have any problem talking about what went on that day, whether it was good or bad. So that's not the searching that we're looking for. But when you look at Psalm 139, now what I'd love to do, but I'm not gonna I don't think we're going to have time to do it, is I actually wanted you to just take your Bible and look at Psalm 139 and glance down through there and see if you notice the place where a change takes place, in which David is first of all saying, you search me and known me, and he says, and you know my uprising and my downsitting and my, you know, and he goes on with all that list of things. He goes on from there, but there's a place in the psalm in which it changes from that kind of a thing, and he starts to move in a different direction. And this, in verse 1, is he is going over that which has already happened. He's going to move in that psalm to... A, a, another searching in which he's going to be talking about that which is going to happen tomorrow. What he's planning to do tomorrow. And it's in that second searching that he's going to start asking God some questions. That's the searching that matches Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Now, let's just kind of read, let me just take, take and, and I know you're kind of scanning down through there, but don't, for the second one, don't just jump to the verse where he's asking him to search his heart. The context of that actually breaks off beforehand. So let's, uh, 
And by the way, just to confirm that, give me that next verse, which is verse 4. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, uh, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. See, David's been talking to his heavenly Father. So now let's begin to go through this and just read and see if we can spot the break real quickly all together. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. As you get to this place, you don't see him asking any questions about anything. He is extolled when he says, well, this knowledge is too wonderful, it's high, I can't attain to it. What he's really doing is he is extolling the virtues of the education. In essence, David is saying, I could have never come up with this myself. You know, this is way beyond me. And that's what's marvelous to me. when so, If someone, and it hasn't happened but about once, if someone says, I think you came up with that, I'm thinking, wow, you must really think I'm smart. Because I got news for you, no man would come up with this. This is something only the genius of God in his manifold wisdom would come up with. But, but th those are the things. Now, he's about to ask a question. So let me take you now to, verse, to the next verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall... By the way, did you notice that's a small case, S? Do not be thinking about the third person of the Godhead when you read that verse. But, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Is he really asking a question that wants an answer, or is he just being rhetorical to make the point, there's not anywhere I can go? Yes, he's being rhetorical, because he's given you the answer right there following. So you see, even though you see a question, that's still not the kind of question that Romans 8, 26 and 27. Is everybody up with me here? I don't want to leave anybody behind. Look, do, look, interactive learning. Can we all agree if someone is not sure about something, they can ask a question and we're all going to be patient with that? You're patient endurance? Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, you know, you're like suffering the rest of us. Okay. Okay. Well, you do have a, you have a spirit, but no, that's not your spirit. That's the Father's spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Yeah, okay. Now, let's go to, uh, let's see, where are we at here? Okay, now we've got to go to verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, Shall thy hand lead me? Do you see the continuation of this thought? I'm not going to be able to get away from your presence no matter what. But by the way, there's something interesting here. Because he says, where will I go? Back, back me up, Trent. Let me, let me do this one more time. Whither shall I go? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? When you get into this next section, he's going to ask you a question. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Paul's going to pick the same thread up in his doctrine and the same things that you're looking at here in Psalm 139. That's the very things Paul is going to pick up and begin now to give you doctrine for. Because some things that are going to happen, that are going to make you think, man, what is going on? Because if God loved me, would this really be happening to me? That's one of five very heart-probing questions that every single one of us are going to have to go home and answer before our Heavenly Father. Not today, of course. That's in that third part of your sonship establishment. But I'm going to tell you something. That is going to be the turning point for you in your sonship life. Because you're not going to answer them up here. We're not going to raise our hands. Nobody's going to come forward. You're not going to do any of that. But you're going to go home, and you're going to answer those five questions to your Heavenly Father. And if you, if you 
Look at those, and you're unsure, you have to settle those before you move on. Those have to get done. All right, let me just do this, and then we'll stop for the break. Uh, Because I actually set this a little short. I set it like I did in Monaghan's. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. That's interesting, that the night will be light about thee. I remember hearing the story of a missionary who uh, grew this pineapple garden, and he was in, in the midst of natives, and he learned their language, and he was trying to win them to Christ, and they trained their kids to steal the pineapples, and they always sent them in there at night. And when they finally got saved, and he was saying, I, they were saying, we used to send our kids in to steal your pineapples. And he, and, and he said, yeah, and I knew that was because you thought, you know, I wouldn't be able to see you at night. And they said, oh, no, we weren't worried about you. We thought, you know what, if your God saw them, he'd be mad. And he said, we remember the first time you said, well, God can see at night just like he can in the daylight. And we all looked at you and like, oh, you know, they didn't realize. They thought, you know, like we do it at night. God won't see us. They thought they were hiding it. for. They could be great believers in the daytime, steal his pineapples at night. No different from y'all. Okay. So, no. So, so now, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. has to do with your emotions. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. All we're reading here, all we're reading here is a continuation of the things that he's been from the beginning. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our break because when we come back, we're going to observe the break in Psalm 139, and now he's going to turn the conversation toward the searching that we've been looking at in Romans 8, 26, and 27. That's where we're going to discuss some very important details, and I'm going to explain to you how that works and answer those questions that we raised in, in, at the beginning of this session. So 10-minute break and then we'll come back.